Welcome to Showcase. Today, love it or loathe it, long reviled brutalist buildings are facing the wrecking ball around the world. But should they? Today, we'll discuss this as we celebrate the 50th birthday of a film that's affectionately called by some as the worst movie ever made. Also on the program, we look back at a genre-bending flick that distorted the line between fiction and reality when it first came out. But first... The old-fashioned masterclasses is when the student plays and the teacher says, let me show you how it goes. That's not teaching, that's basically showing. Learning from the master, we head online, born. where a violin virtuoso is sharing his process with the world. Engraving the Past, an exhibition of Albrecht Dürer's etchings, opens in Kiev. The impact of this artist on German culture at the beginning of the 16th century was so great that a whole time span was named the Dürer era. Albrecht Dürer was not only an innovative painter, but he was also a master of engraving, who introduced radical and technical innovations, many of which were copied by his peers. And now, for the first time, Dürer's work is being shown in Kiev, alongside those who chose to imitate the master. The Virgin on the Crescent, the Annunciation, and the Life of the Virgin are among the masterpieces on display in Kiev, Ukraine, for the first time. Dürer's influence on the culture of his country was so immense that researchers often call the 16th century Dürer's era. He was the first to engrave on both wood and copper, introducing philosophical ideas into this art form. In print graphics, Dürer was one of a kind. His dialography technique was just as expressive as his engraving on metal. His wood engravings were elevated to a form of fine art, where the most minute details were carved to perfection. Engraving before Dürer was very simple, primitive even. There were just contours and a bit of shading. Dürer elevated this art form to a level no other master could reach. Among the most famous exhibits, the series Life of Maria. Here the author presented typical city dwellers and a multitude of details of their everyday life. Some of the exhibits are presented side by side with their copies made by Marc Antonio Raimondi. The conflict between Dürer and Raimondi turned into one of the first intellectual property lawsuits of the time. Marc Antonio put Dürer's monogram everywhere. They were copywriters too in those days. The rights were called privileges, but they did not cover the whole of Europe. Dürer had privileges for the German Empire, but his rights did not cover Italy. This is why Marc Antonio could make his own series. When Dürer came to Venice and filed lawsuit in court stating that he was the author and that Raimondi's series was a copy, the court decided that Raimondi could continue making copies, but he could not put Dürer's monogram on them. One of the mystical works of Dürer is The Walk, where he depicts death. In Dürer's time, mortality rates were very high. In this piece, he shows that death does not spare anybody. The man sees death and it shows on his face. This perhaps is a very psychological piece. We can clearly see how a person's state changes. This piece carries a lot of mysteries as well. The sea creature was made based on a story by a Flemish writer about a creature that lives in a lake and that kidnaps beautiful young women. Here you can also see the title sheet for the Apocalypse series, which made the master famous in Europe. Albrecht Dürer created 374 engravings on wood and 83 on copper. His engravings made up a whole new form of art and won him fame all over Europe. As a graphic artist, Dürer made a tremendous impact on all contemporary masters and the generations to come. His work may have been copied, but still, 
it served as inspiration for a multitude of other engravers. Today, his art is presented in museums all around the world. Imagine walking out of a movie theater after watching Martin Scorsese's latest film and getting a lesson from the director himself at home. Well, now that's possible through an online teaching institution called Masterclass, whose philosophy is called Learn from the Best. And with Margot Atwood teaching creative writing and Massimo Bottura teaching Italian cooking, it's not hard to see why. And joining that list is perhaps the most well-known living violin player in the world. Take a look. If you talk to a person who is, let's say, 50 years old and never touched the instrument, you might as well talk to somebody who is five years old who never touched the instrument because we are starting from the beginning. That's the ethos of his online course. With his award-winning work spanning 40 years and more, Itzhak Perlman has played for three presidents, been given the Presidential Medal of Freedom and performed for the British Queen as well as for thousands of fans all over the world. I don't know if I broke ground. I know, I, I, I hope that whatever I had to say was, was something that was meaningful to other people, you know, I mean, and that, that I did justice to the pieces that I that I played and that I convinced the audience that that's what I did. So that's all, you know, all I can do is, is be myself and do the best that I can. At the age of four, Perlman was diagnosed with polio, but he continued to teach himself how to play the fiddle until he was old enough to get admission into the prestigious Juilliard School in New York. I'm Isaac Perlman and this is my master class. Now working with an online organization called Masterclass, he's bringing his passion to your home, starting with the fiddly basics. When you connect with the music, that connection will radiate to the audience. Everybody that plays the violin is a fiddle player. Or everybody uh, in the classical music field, you know, when they go to, let's say, a violin shop to look at a very nice violin, they would say, oh, really terrific looking fiddle because that's what it is, you know, so it's just a matter of semantics. Make the bow work for you. Don't force the bow to jump. A single class of the online masterclass costs $90, or people can pay $15 a month for unlimited lessons. Perlman believes the variety of topics and questions covered will be beneficial to anyone who wants to progress in their art. class has accomplished a lot. To be happy forming great music and enjoy what you are doing, what could be better? These days, the price is just outrageous. So what do, what do kids do, you know, today, you know, when you're an 18 year old and you are, you know, you're in good, uh, you have a very good level of playing and you're looking for a fine instrument. What do you do? So we talk about that. What do you do about being nervous? We talk about that. You know, we talk about, and you would hope that it would reach various levels of uh, of people who are interested in the instrument or interested in music or interested in what goes on in the classroom. Be a musician is almost like to be a magician. You don't want the listener to realize what you're doing. If you get all of that stuff, you can learn to play the violin in two hours. Coming up later on Showcase, something wicked this way comes. You see? You see? Your stupid minds! Stupid! Stupid! That's all I'm taking from you. We remember cult film director Ed Wood's low-budget sci-fi opus, Plan 9 from Outer Space, a film some people call the worst movie ever made. I can see you. I'm real excited about this. Thank you for I'm the opportunity. I'm very glad. We head back to the Black Hills of Maryland to celebrate the 20th anniversary of a film that changed the way we saw court fictional documentaries. Architectural masterpieces or concrete eyesores. We discuss whether brutalist buildings should be preserved or torn down. The Second World War brought with it massive urban destruction across Europe. And an easy, 
quick economic solution to the problem was brutalist architecture. Raw, concrete, monolithic, these fortress-like buildings were commonly used for governmental projects as well as socially progressive housing solutions. They soon became ubiquitous in communist countries, mainly due to their function over form ethos. Brutalist designs have historically been polarizing. Seen by many as unwelcoming and inhumane, brutalism also had devoted fans praising its philosophy and striking aesthetics. Taking the world by storm for three decades, the movement fell out of favor in the 1970s. In fact, brutalism was vilified, as the buildings it yielded mostly became synonymous with crime-ridden, poorly lit and graffitied menaces. As a result, a great number of brutalist buildings have been torn down despite widespread objections. These days, there are only a few countries on the map without a decent brutalist example or two. And for the postmodernist blocks that remain standing, they might not be around for much longer, with many of them facing the wrecking ball. Joining us to talk about whether or not brutalist buildings should be demolished is activist Felix Torco. He is a spokesperson of the SOS Brutalism Project, a platform that is fighting to preserve brutalist architecture. Felix, so what exactly is the situation with brutalist architecture at the moment? I mean, are all brutalist, brutalist buildings in jeopardy? What we do see is a lot of buildings are getting refurbished extensively, so they lose all of their character. Other buildings are just being demolished right away. A few buildings actually are also starting to get heritage protected. But really, I think at the, most of the buildings or the lion's share is just slowly dilapidating and nobody really cares about them. So. But why do you think this is happening? Why is it brutalist architecture in particular that is under threat? I think it's difficult for brutalist architecture in particular because its heritage value or its architectural historical value hasn't really been recognized yet. Uh, to make a comparison, maybe it's interesting to look back 60 years when these buildings were actually built. During that time, a lot of buildings from the turn of the century or the 1890s were demolished. And if we look back at that today, we're really surprised how much wonderful buildings have been demolished back then just because they were out of fashion. And back then those buildings weren't much older than 60 years old, really. And if you look at brutalism today, those buildings are about 60 year old now and they have fallen out of fashion and being demolished right now. And we really have to ask ourselves if we're not repeating past mistakes. But um why do you think brutalist architecture should be kept and preserved? I mean, there are two sides to this debate, of course. Please convince me, what is so special about brutalist architecture? Well, I think brutalist architecture is, there's just such a drama and there's this sculpturality and this massive monumentality to it. And also a lot of just like material that you can touch, there's a haptic quality to it. But if you think about it, I think there are two big reasons why it should be preserved. One, we're actually just in danger of losing an important part of our collective history, our architectural history of the 20th century before it can really be appreciated. But I think a second point that is really important to mention is also you have to think about the environment. So if you have a building that already has been erected with a lot of resources and a lot of energy and you're knocking all of this down and you're rebuilding a completely new structure it is such a huge amount of energy and resources that are being used for that. If you in turn use an old building and refurbish it and remodel it and make something new out of it, I think it's much more environmentally friendly and uh, frankly just better for the future. And also let me play the devil's advocate here. In post-communist countries, these buildings represent an era that many people are not fond of remembering. So what would you say? Maybe would, would I mean, is your policy different when it comes to post-communist um, contexts? 
it is true post-communist countries are a very difficult topic because it is very difficult to separate architecture and architects from the politics that are happening at that time. But actually, if you look closely to especially brutalist architecture in uh, communist or in back then communist countries, the architects were really pushing the boundaries and trying to be as independent as possible from the politics. And they were actually very innovative and up there on an international level and they were creating a lot of daring designs that worked well and that would have been really phenomenal and maybe better received in other countries. So I think it's important to be able to separate a little what independent architects were doing and what was happening politically at that time. And also you mentioned several times that it uh, fell out of fashion. Uh, after a while, but then many people are saying that it's making a comeback as well, this sort of like brutalist uh, uh, concrete style. Why are people saying that? That is a really interesting question. Actually, I've, I've been thinking about this recently and I'm in the process of writing a whole book about this exact question. I don't have all the answers yet, but one theory is that in today's world that is very much uh, dematerialized and virtual, these ideas about authenticity and materiality and also haptics, things like that are very contemporary things again that people are interested in or maybe there's a little bit of a longing. But it's really curious to see it's not just re, uh, resurgence in academic interest. There's also a lot of uh, broader public interest on the internet. It's a big social media phenomenon at this time. A lot of people are interested again. And surprisingly, I, I see architects building in this style or this ethos again. And they have been doing this for the last 10 or 15 years. And it's quite curious that while the old buildings are still being neglected and torn down and disrespected, new buildings that are in very much the same ethos are being created like that. It's quite the paradox. It really is a paradox. It's quite interesting, but we'll have to leave it there. Felix Torkar, spokesperson of the SOS Brutalism Project. Thank you so much for joining us today. Let's rewind to 1999, a year that brought with it a slew of psychological horror films, including The Sixth Sense and The Ninth Gate. But perhaps the creepiest of all of them was The Blair Witch Project. It didn't have an A-list Hollywood team behind it, or much of a budget for that matter, but it shocked the living daylights out of Weavers, because at some point it felt just a little too real. Clever marketing helped further blur the line between fact and fiction. And while it wasn't the first film to do it, it took the idea of true horror to a whole new level. Man seems to ignore the fact that on this very planet there are still people living in the Stone Age and practicing cannibalism. Four brave young Americans went there to make a documentary on life in the jungle, armed with cameras, microphones and curiosity. Never came back. Never it all started in 1980 when a film called Cannibal Holocaust introduced audiences to a new genre of movie making. The film jumps between interviews and some found footage of a documentary crew which apparently went missing while shooting in the Amazon rainforest, successfully convincing viewers they were actually watching a true story unfold. To explore the Blair Witch. 19 years later, filmmakers again attempted to pull the wool over people's eyes in The Blair Witch Project. The movie set in 1994 and tells the story of three film students who were making a documentary of a local legend known as The Blair Witch. None of the students were seen again until one year later when their equipment and footage was found and turned into a film. The film terrified many during its festival run, building up a huge amount of hype for its release. I think this is a classic example of hype. This film has made all the film festivals. The right critics have written about it. They've talked about it, Ebert and all those guys. And everybody's curious, you know, curiosity is peaked and they go see it. 
Word of mouth and festival buzz were not the only attracting factors. The film also reached the world via the internet, making it one of the first widely released films primarily marketed online. People were asking about it, and people were asking about it, is there a website? So we just decided to treat the website as if, you know, the information was real. And uh, we took, you know, we just took the, the, the mythology and Heather's journal and all the timeline, everything that's been going on in, in this area near, near Burgessville for 200 years and laid it out, you know, and, and, and used a lot of the stuff that we had already shot to put in there. And, uh, you know, it became pretty popular. The website included convincing looking evidence, news reports and police officers, all played by actors to add to the sense of realism of the story. It went completely viral before going viral was even a thing. In four months they got 20 million hits on that internet. So then zero uh, uh, television advertising, it was all like pure, no money out of the pocket campaign. And before you knew it, every everybody in the world was just trying to figure out what's the story with this, this whole deal. And it's just, it was just madness once it, once it all came through. And as the screams got louder, so did the pull at the box office. The film is a 60, had a $60,000 budget, no big stars. In Hollywood, you know, the norm is to spend, you know, 50, 75, 100 million dollars on a film, put some huge stars in it, spend millions on marketing, and hope to have a 29 million dollar uh, weekend. And Blair Witch just, you know, three weeks into its run, it finally went wide and it, it did just that. It made over 29 million dollars. It's, it's unheard of. Uh, I don't know of another case where we've seen a film with this type of budget, no name stars, doing this kind of business. It's a real testament to the marketing of the picture. You know, if you don't believe in the Blair Witch, then why the hell did you bother to come? I thought the movie was cool. The film was the 14th highest grossing film of 1999, collecting numerous awards. The sequel was fast-tracked and in typical Hollywood fashion, given a glossy treatment. Gone was the low quality camera footage, the shaky running scenes through the forest, and more importantly, the lack of what made the first film so great, the found footage aspect, were all lost in the woods, including any future film potential. The guy who uploaded this video said it was from a tape he found in the Black Hills woods. After a 16 year gap, a new set of filmmakers went to tackle the witch, paying particular attention to the core aesthetic of the original film. Found footage has always been kind of a faux documentary type of thing, you know, like uh, Blair Witch Project set that up as a literal documentary and, you know, Wreck and, you know, Paranormal Activity and all those kind of films. Like a lot of them take this kind of documentary approach, you know, not just to the, the, the film and the reason why they're filming, but to the camera work and that kind of thing. Five strangers returned to the woods to uncover the truth. Now these sequels didn't live up to the impact the original film had, not only at the box office, but also on viewers. If there is any chance that I could find out what happened to her, I need to try. But the bar was set quite high with the original, which worked so well because of timing and its fresh revamp of the found footage genre of filmmaking. That wraps up another episode of Showcase. Don't forget, you can find more of our stories on our YouTube channel. But before we say goodbye, legend has it that B-movie director Ed Wood famously said he'd always be remembered for Plan 9 from Outer Space, a feature about UFOs made out of tin plates invading planet Earth. To his credit, Wood wasn't wrong, and as his low-budget sci-fi epic turns 50, many still remember this larger-than-life movie but maybe not for the reasons would intend it. Until next time, I'm Elif Bereketli. Bye for now. The home they had so long shared together became a tomb, a sweet memory of her joyous living. The sky to which she had once looked was now only a covering for her dead body. See? 
You see? Your stupid minds. Stupid. Stupid. That's all I'm taking from you. Get back here, you jerk! Let him finish. It's because of men like you that all must be destroyed. Headstrong. Violent. No use of the mind God gave you. You talk of God? You also think it impossible that we, too, might think of God? We got to hand it to them, though. They, they're far ahead of us. Oh! <laughs>